Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Patricio Gallardo, and I am a PhD candidate here at the University of Canterbury. My area of research looks at transportation as an energy system. And during my research, I've ha had the chance to explore on the implications of the EV, EV electric vehicle adoption here in New Zealand. So the presentation today is basically covering some of the highlights, highlights from my research and also we're bringing additional concerns from the scientific literature. Um, what is the motivation? So uh, EVs, is, is the adoption of EVs is currently a hot topic. Uh, there's already a set of targets. It is expected by, that by 2021, we would have 64,000 additional EVs in, on the added to the EV fleet. And it is also expected that cost parity will drive a further uh, adoption of EVs so that by 2040, 40% of the light vehicle fleet will be electric. Uh, in New Zealand, EVs, uh, the EV option can be, uh, can be considered as a feasible approach given its high share of renewable resources. Uh, but now there's some implications that are, are worth um, looking deeper into. So the first one is that the charging loads from EVs will um, add a stress on the power system. And it is likely that the adoption of EVs will require substantial investment, not only in EV, te EV technology, but also on important upgrades on the power transmission and distribution. Uh, system. Moreover, if, if EVs are, or the batteries from EVs are going to be used as decentralized means of storage, then um, the system it is likely that the system will depend on some sort of a smart infrastructure, a smart grid infrastructure. So in this, today's presentations, we, we, there's two, two, two parts. In the first part, presents the highlights of a retroanalysis assessment. So think about it this way, on a routine medical check, um, you go to the doctor and he, he checks your blood pressure, your weight and so on. In a similar manner, we want to use official data in New Zealand, uh, on New Zealand's energy system, and we want to assess the implications of EVs on the power system and also investigate its potential as an emission mitigation pathway. Uh, the second part, uh, presents additional hurdles that have been put forward in the scientific literature, specifically around the feasibility of vehicle to grid schemes. Uh, some key concepts before we go on to the, the, the methods. So reserve margin contrasts uh, peak power requirements, that's electricity demand uh, with the transmission and distribution losses against the rated cap capacity uh, of the system and the availability of these resources in time. So this is relevant as a relevant metric as we're dealing with intermittent uh, resources like wind and uh, hydroelectric. Uh, another thing is that we wanna contrast direct and indirect emissions. In our case, we look at total emissions. So we're looking at also at how electricity is being produced uh, and this itself depends on the availability that we mentioned earlier. Um, we used a retro analysis, which is circumscribed uh, within step three of the in-time framework. So already scenarios are placed at a point in the past in, and the impact of the technology development of objective is evaluated using actual historical data. So the, the idea of this approach is that we wanna avoid speculating on future uh, demand growth and also on the feasibility of non-unproven technologies. Uh, well, base, the base year is 2012 as we had uh, transport and energy data available for this year. Uh, I won't talk much about this slide, but it, I wanna mention that LIB was our modeling tool. It is an industry benchmark used by uh, researchers and consultants throughout the world and it's been used to assess uh, policy scenarios uh, for energy systems planning at a national scale. 
we looked into three parameters. Um, so first um, level of adoption, we have two targets and also looked into charging strategies. So our first assumption or in the first, first scenario, we assumed that the charging load would be distributed evenly uh, within a, a peer, an eight off peak hours. And in the second more drastic scenario or more critical scenario, the charging lo load will be distributed over three off peak hours. And we see that actually our assumptions match what it is uh, the expected load curve. Uh, this is a study done in Korea. This is, and, and they forecasted what, what was going to be the shape of the load curve from uh, charging EVs. Um, uh, it is also reasonable well, to, to explore the modifications to the power system as emissions from EVs are highly dependent on grid composition. Um, so we modeled the mixed renewables scenario uh, that was put forward by the Ministry of Business Innovation and Employment. So um, in this scenario, we expect uh, additional or further additions in capacity, especially from geothermal and, and, and wind. Uh, actually, it is expected that between 2012 and 2040, we will have um, three gigawatts of additional capacity. So first, what is the impact of EVs on an un un unmodified grid? So we see first that the we're having a hard time dealing with our winter peak. So the reserve margin in this case was negative for the base year. And in, in reality, this was probably, uh, probably tolerated to load shedding. Um, we also see that well, the 64,000 uh, vehicles does not really represent much in terms of load, of charging load and the impact uh, is, is not substantial either. It's, we just have a, a negative 0.1 reduction in emissions. Uh, as we get more serious into into the EV pad into the EV pathway, we see that a 40% share actually has important effects on the re reliability of your power system. As the reserve margin drops further by five and 13% in comparison to the basis scenario, and but. On the other hand, we see that we're still not achieving significant reductions in emissions. So what if we combine EV adoption with an, up an upgrade on the power system? Now, uh, we, we get more significant uh, uh, numbers in terms of greenhouse gas emission reduction. Now, still, we see the contrast between the charging behavior. So our, our reserve margin can either improve to 13% or in the worst case, only to 5%. Give it just, this is due to the charging behavior as well. And one interesting feature is that we see that most of the um, uh, reduction in greenhouse gas emission is actually owed to the upgrades in the power system. Only a 7% is owed to the adoption of EVs. And this figure even drops further when we consider um, the battery embedded emissions. In regards to the energy cost, this, these figures only correspond to energy system cost. And, and we see that if we adopt EVs, then uh, the cost reduced as we no longer require uh, to import fossil fuels. However, these savings in costs are offset by the, the necessary upgrades in, in, in power system infrastructure. Uh, moreover, we see that there's a cost of inaction. So having this fossil fuel dependency and having our uh, reserves depleted uh, represents a, an, a, a risk to, to the energy system. So there, we do need to think about long-term strategies to meet, mitigate these risks. Uh, additional hurdles. So now um, it is expected that EVs will take the role of a decentralized uh, storage for the power system. This concept is often reserved as vehicle to grid and EVs uh, 
play a, an integral element on the power grid. Its feasibility is subject to dynamically charged and, re, um, and discharged batteries. So the system depends on, on this concept of the, of, on, on the so-called concept of smart grid. Um, enabling vehicle to grid implies a redefinition of the architecture of the power system. Um, so there's some technical implications. This level of flexibility will rely on additional electronic uh, communication and connection infrastructure and novel interfaces between users, vehicles, and utilities. It is likely that these upgrades will inc incur in additional cost. And that's the, well, the, one of the problems is that there's a high uncertainty on the costs of, of the smart grid technology as the technology is still new, expensive, and it has not been deployed on a national scale. It's not, it has not been fully standardized. On the economic side, um, energy, well, EV users may profit by trading in differences in spot prices within the electricity market. But as more uses become engaged into this market, then there will be less room for profit. Um, moreover, um, there's not room much, for, not, not much room left for backup, backup power system storage as the, the economic potential of vehicle to grid for ancillary services will be limited as just a fraction of the fleet assessed will saturate the market. And well, um, the profitability of, of vehicle to grid is strongly attached to the degradation of the batteries. The, the lithium iron battery degradation governs the economic viability of vehicle to grid. So um, that's an additional constraint on, on this smart grid concept. That's, um, it, it will require that this, this system provides the battery management as well. And we see that if batteries are not managed properly, then the, their performance decreased if for instance, we let the state of charge go beyond 40%. Um, an additional aspect, well, the regulatory aspects. So smart grids will likely require implementation of a legal framework, framework that regulates accessibility to in-vehicle data and, and resources. Uh, one aspect that is often overlooked is the availability of lithium. And well, there's plenty of reserves in the world, but not all of these are commercially recoverable. So this, this is another limitation. And uh, the other thing is that the current rate of extraction is likely not to fulfill the requirements from a global large adoption of EV technology. And another thing is that 2% of, only 2% of all the lithium iron batteries that have been produced so far have been recycled. So we're not sure of what is going to happen when all these uh, batteries reach their, their lifetime. So conclusions, um, we see from our, our research findings that our uncoordinated charging will have a drastic impact on, on power system reliability. So this is an aspect to, to, to consider more seriously. Um, there's high uncertainty in future costs, especially associated to the concept of smart grid technology. Uh, we should also be looking into other alternatives involving multiple pathways. So earlier we saw that um, the urban form can have a significant impact on in terms of energy demand and emissions. So providing accessibility or more accessibility to active means of transportation and public transport can have significant impacts in terms of, of uh, greenhouse gas emission reduction. Um, and another aspect is that the availability of lithium. Uh, definitely this is another, another feature that we should look more deep into and, uh, and the recyclability of lithium as well. Uh, this is, this is the end of my presentations. Thank, thank for your time. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you.